I really want you to hear this testimony. So it's a little different, but I think you'll be blessed by it. And then uh, I don't know where to go find this testimony. It's a tape that I got that was a special cassette tape of a testimony from many, many years ago. And I don't know if it exists anymore, even though the story's still true. So I digitized it, and then we're going to listen to it. Otherwise, I would just make reference to it and have you go listen to it yourself. Um, we're studying the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation is what? It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, right? It's, a, it's not a revelation of end-time events, though it includes end-time events. There's a lot of end-time events in the whole of the Bible. Many of them are mentioned in the book of Revelation, not all of them. So it is not a complete book, and it wasn't designed to be that. It really is a testimony of Jesus, and we get a look of, of him as he is... Uh, using the authority that he earned by his obedience as a perfect son, savior, messiah, high priest, lamb of God, son of God, he fulfilled all those aspects of his calling, and as a result of that, he was given all authority. Uh, there's a distinction there. Jesus isn't all-powerful. He has all authority. God's all-powerful. Jesus has earned the right to manage the affairs of humankind, and God will back his authority with his power. We need to recognize that because we have also been given, and we grow in it, but we have been given a level of authority in the name of Jesus. So you can say, I'm not as powerful as, let's say, the devil. You're not, but you have more authority than him. So when you exercise your authority of who you are in Christ, then God begins to back up your word with things. So that's important. But you and I have a level of authority and a sphere of influence. Some of us have, in, we all have authority over our lives. You are the sovereign of your life in a very real sense. So we all have that authority. Some of us have increasing spheres of authority, but Jesus has absolute all authority over all creation. So it's always good to buddy up with Jesus, hear what he's saying, and get permission to say what he's saying, and then what you're saying will come to pass, because if your word aligns with his word, it's the word, and he will be a blessing on that. All right, so um, I, I can move on with that. I, we're, we're in chapter 4. It's 11 verses, 1 through 11. Should I keep this handheld? Keep going with that for a while still? Okay. I'm okay with that. Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to read just verse 1. That's what I'm going to read right now. And, um, okay, so are we good? I'm going to read it. I'll just ignore the screen. Oh, man. Is there... I am going to get this message out. I'm telling you. It's just too good. All right, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, this is the Apostle John, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So this is the Apostle John, and he, this chapter, after these things. So uh, in the notes, but I want you to picture this. John probably has just sent off the seven letters that Jesus gave him for the churches. Perhaps he, they were mailed off. Ships would visit the island, so they were, he put them on the ship, and he sent these letters off. Five of the churches received severe correction. One had nothing good said about it, and all were challenged to prepare for the battle in, of the age. So here's John a faithful and outstanding shepherd of God, separated from his flock, imprisoned on Patmos because he served humanity with the love of God. His captors wanted John. I want you to hear this. His captors wanted John to feel helpless, defeated, and rejected in the face of impending disappointment. And I suspect he did. The whole idea of captivity is to foster helplessness in you, to get you to a place where you feel defeated 
and that perhaps nobody cares about you anymore and nobody believes in you anymore. That's the whole point of being held captive. John is on an island, and, there's, and I have a sense that he's feeling that, and then we can be held captive in our thoughts where the adversary is trying to get us to believe that as well. And so, after he sends these letters out, after those things, he looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. This is more than just John getting a glimpse. It is an invitation for him to see things from God's perspective rather than from his captor's perspective. That's, that's the revelation of Jesus, that we see things from his perspective, not from the cap, our captor's perspective. Well, one, we're not captive. We've been liberated. Are we good? All right, so that's really important because if we, if we fix our eyes or our mind or our meditation or our thoughts on how we perceive things, we'll be defeated. We'll feel rejected, and we're almost certain disappointment is headed our way, so why even bother? I quit now. And that's the whole point of the adversary's press against us. And if we don't take the invitation to come into this open door, and, and see from his perspective. And it is an invitation. And it's available to any one of us. If we will take that invitation and come up and be with him, he will give us a whole new vantage point, not only of what is, but, but what he's going to do about it. And that's really good news. So we're never held hostage by our circumstances unless we don't come in the door. Okay. And I, I think that's really important for us to recognize this is John's experience. Now, he says, I looked and behold. This, this word behold, it isn't just an old English word. He isn't just saying, I, I looked and I saw. He says, I look and behold. This is a, this is a specific word that, is being, that he's giving voice to. And it's, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll liken it to this. Hey, anybody, anybody see my pen? I dropped my pen. It's silver. It's slippery. That's why I dropped it. It's really expensive. No, I'm giving you an example, but thank you. <laughs> and then if I were to say, oh, here it is. Then, the, the, here, I see it. I see it. That is not the word behold. Because once I see it, you don't need to be looking for it. I mean, I, I've recovered it. I'm just going to put it in my pocket. And you might say, well, boy, you're really anxious about that. Can I see it? And I, I might show it to you, but basically I don't need you to see that. But let's say I was financially struggling or something, and um, I went into my backyard and I saw a little sparkly thing, and I kind of kicked it, and I realized, oh, this might be something. And all of a sudden I realized it's a gold nugget the size of a bowling ball. Okay? Okay. I'm going to go to my wife and say, behold, there it is, the mother load, right there in our yard. I want you to see, it wouldn't be like, hey, guess what I saw today, right? It would be behold. John comes and he, see, he's, he, comes and he sees this door and he wants us to see it. He, he's not just saying, I saw a door. He goes, I saw a door and I want you to see it. It's an open door into heaven, and the Lord is going to say to you, come up here. Come in this door. This is what John is saying. Thank you. Before I throw it at somebody or something. <clears throat> it was going around, wasn't it? <laughs> so behold, and then what did he see? A door standing open in heaven. And I just want you to know, John wants you to see that. He wants me to see it. He wants us to see it. And then it goes on, it says, and the, and, the, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, now I put, I put the text in red in the notes. It's not red in my Bible. And I took the liberties of saying, I think Jesus is saying this. Because Jesus is the one who's disclosing the revelation to John because God granted him permission to do that. And it says that it's the voice of a trumpet, which was the voice John heard in the first chapter, which was Jesus, that sounded like a trumpet. It doesn't have to be Jesus. It's not, 
I'm not making it that important, but, what I'm, but, I, but Jesus is, at least is in charge of the summons. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this, after his letters were sent out and, and all that. And now I don't have verse 2, it, it is up there I think, but it, it says immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven. So John says I was in the spirit and behold a throne. I want you to see this throne, John's saying. It isn't I just saw, saw a throne. I want you to see it too. That's the idea, behold. But I'm going to pause a little bit, and I'm going to take a little liberty now. And when John says, immediately I was in the Spirit. Do you know that you could be in the Spirit right now? How, how do I do that? You may not get fully in, let's say, but you could be in the Spirit. And I feel like the Lord wants me to encourage us in this. By praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. That, and I felt like the Lord saying, if you can hear this, He is inviting you to do this. To set aside 30 minutes a day to pray in the Spirit. And that the Lord will start opening your eyes to behold. And that just participate with that. Let him exercise you and your, and your spirit. Let him exercise your sensitivity to the things. And the time will come when all of a sudden you will see what he has been wanting to show you. The open door for us, or maybe the doorknob for that door, is praying in the spirit. Now, that is not this text, but I am offering that because I really sense that the Lord was saying... Help my people see by inviting them to pray in the Spirit. So I invite you to, so the Lord is inviting you to do that, okay? Pray in the Spirit. 30 minutes a day. And it, you don't have to feel good about it. You are doing good and you are exercising it if you'll do that. And the time will come when some momentum will build in your life. In fact, I remember Jack Hayford, who's a four-square pastor out in California, he's He's retired from that position now, and he's kind of moves around and speaks a lot. There were people who would say, boy, you sure seem to like always prophesy a lot without knowing it. You would just speak into people's lives and say things that were just right on target even before they happened. And his response was, I think I get all that because I pray in the Spirit a lot. And it just, I get downloads that I don't even know I have until I meet someone and all of a sudden the inventory is released into their life. So it's this move of the Spirit that comes from him praying in the Spirit. So you don't always have to know what you're praying, just know that as you're praying, you are speaking in a language that can be the language of men, but Paul says it can be the language of angels. So you don't have to know what you're saying, you don't have to interpret it or put it this way, as you speak it, the time will come maybe five days later when you speak into someone's life, and then there's the interpretation. So don't let some well-meaning people who don't have the experience define your experience for you. Speak in tongues, pray in the Spirit, and then the time will come when it will be released, and then you can say, well, I interpreted it. It was just five days later. That's okay. Is there a rule that it has to be within 23 seconds or anything like that? No. So go ahead. Just, But I would invite you to exercise in that. Okay? Are we good? That'd be good. If you, don't, if you haven't had that release to be praying in the Spirit, we'll make prayer available after service today. You come up and we'll pray for you. Don't not do that. You say, well, I don't know. You're right. You don't know. So come on up. Receive a gift and, and then put it to use. <clears throat> And it's amazing how the Lord does start allowing you to start seeing in, your, in the mind of your spirit the things you're praying for as you pray in the spirit. You start, integrity starts to build in the faculties that you have as you do that. Okay, so um, I wanna, one thing I want to point out here, because I think this is really important. The door that opened for John was the one to come into God's perspective. It was not a door to get off the island. We should know that. It wasn't a door of escape. It was a door of entrance into the presence of God. I promise you, 
if you had a door off the island or this door and John had had experience by, as he does now, he's going to go through this amazing revelation of Jesus Christ, I can promise you John would have said, I'm glad I didn't take the door off the island if it meant I would have missed this one. So the Lord opened a door to him and the Lord has a door open to us. <clears throat> I guess I just want to restate that just a little bit. If you're in a situation where you don't know where to, what direction to go because you can't find a door, then take the one that's being offered. Pray in the Spirit. Enter into your time with the Lord. That door is open to you. Come up and get his perspective. And I believe that. In fact, I felt like the Lord said, That's, that is how I'm going to reveal, because I, I had a time with the Lord. I said, Lord, this is it. This is the hour in which you're going to give wisdom for us as a congregation on where we're going to land and what's going to happen. This is the time. And I felt like the, door, the Lord says, yes, then you come through that door, and I will show you these things. So, And I invite you to be praying with us on that. Okay, so this door is not a door off the island of Patmos. It's an open door into heaven. And I'm just going to read what I wrote. It's an it's a do open door into heaven, God's presence, the worship center of all creation, and the fountainhead from which all authority flows. That's the door John's walking into. It is an open door to the very throne of the living God, and John has written us, by Jesus' command to invite us to behold and come up and enter into. That's the point of this book. This is why he says, whoever reads it is blessed. You're gaining a perspective of how God's going to manage the earth. So that's pretty cool. So we don't have to be overcome with fear, wringing our hands, be distressed and all that. And all the little details that do pertain to my life, the door is still open for me to come and gather those details. I so believe it, and I so believe it's really important right now for us to, to start learning the door and learning how to a, approach that. So this is a revelation of Jesus to John, to you, to the whole church. Don't believe you are helpless. Heaven is filled, as we're going to see, with creatures engaged in the divine recovery of the earth and he has not left you out of that don't believe you are defeated your works reach beyond your imprisonment and even your death that's part of the message of this book your works are not in vain even if you can't get off the island john your works are still working even if you get martyred your works are still bearing fruit so get to work because it, they, and don't be defeated. And then don't take rejection personally for the Lord will fight for us. He's going to fight for us. And then rejoice for impending disappointment will be rerouted into complete triumph. Those are the things that John is going to get by walking in this door and that the Lord is summoning us to. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's like really good news. Probably the number one plan of the adversary right now is to discourage the saints, weary the saints, wear out the saints, depress the saints, have the saints feel like they're losing the battle, that they're, everything they've worked for is not going to come to pass, and to have great despair. That is the tactic of the adversary at play right now. And I bet if I asked for a show of hands of how many could relate to that in some fashion or another, some hands would go up. And that this whole sense of, well, it's just, you know, I know it's Sunday, but uh, I just don't feel like it. Of course you don't. Why would you? It's a plan to get you to not feel like it, although that's not true. I, I, Chris said this is the greatest place on earth. I think he's right. We come together. We just need a perspective, and we need God's perspective, and that's what the Lord invited for John to participate in. Okay, now we're going to listen to a little bit of a testimony, and... Um, but I, let me read this. I don't think I have it up here. Um, but as, if you get your notes, and I'm going to invite you to get them. How many did download the notes? How many, how, well, you know, they're, they're going to be there, so you can still get it. In fact, AJ, 
let's see if we can correct those. Okay? Is that a thumbs up? Yeah. All right. Because I, I want them formatted right. It, they're still there. What happens is the top of the one page ran into the bottom of the page preceding it, and, and it's a little awkward, but nothing too bad. But um, it, I have in there talking about the thrones, how these thrones work. You know, it says that the Messiah will be enthroned on the Father's throne. That's a verse out of Psalms. And that there's 12 apostles sit on thrones, 24 elders sit on thrones, and that other uh, unbelievers will be judged at a great white throne. So there's lots of mentions of thrones. 43 times in the book of Revelation, thrones are mentioned. At 14 times in this chapter, thrones. It, this is thrones are authority. And it is that God has his throne and that he is actually seating people on the throne as well. And then um, just the idea of beauty and the elders. And uh, I got a little thing in the notes on what could be the elders. And, bes- and my notes are opinions because um, there's other opinions out there. But uh, my opinions are safe. You're not going to miss the rapture because of my opinions. So it's, they're, just, they're safe, but they're ideas. But I want you to think, and I'm hoping that they'll help you picture things. And then it goes into crowns, and there's all sorts of crowns that are mentioned in scriptures as well. And then the idea is that the Lord is developing his church to be the church who will become kings and priests unto our God, and that there is, he's developing us for this. And then I have a little piece in here talking about the seven spirits of God and I, I again there's varying opinions on that the book of Enoch which is not part of scripture and shouldn't be but it's used sometimes as a history book um, talks about that there's seven archangels and uh, so it's possible that these are the archangels Gabriel was an archangel Michael's an archangel referred to as an archangel we know that Michael when Daniel was praying Michael came to, because the prince of Persia was withholding Gabriel from bringing a message to Daniel. So the prince of Persia was this, is this powerful fallen being that was withholding Gabriel from getting the message. So Michael, he called Michael your prince, Daniel. So Michael's like the, the prince of Israel came and fought with Gabriel against the prince of P- Persia so Gabriel could get through to Daniel. So there is a heavenly conflict out there that is engaged by these very powerful, strategic, authorized beings going on there. And that revelation reveals much of that because we, the Lord wants us to know what's happening. And you can come in here and say, well, we got a lot of empty seats. Yeah, we do, but we have a lot, there's a lot more space being filled up here than we realize. Trust me. That is the truth. One is you just all have an angel. You do, you know. You got it when you were born or conceived, whenever. And as I say, it doesn't leave because you grow up. It's a sign to you. In fact, I'm kicking around the idea, and I probably shouldn't uh, get too much on a tangent, that I, I'm, I suspect that your guardian angel serves during your life and is done. I don't know that guardian angels, get, okay, well, good, got rid of that charge. Now I got a new one. Hopefully this one's better than the last one. I don't think it works like that. I think they're all in, like you live one life. They are sent to minister on your behalf as an heir of salvation or to bring you into salvation. But even when you're brought in, they're to work with you, and that is their assignment. And that if we engage them and work with them, and then when we graduate, they graduate. And, and I don't know, you know, so they probably just go to heaven and hang out with you and say, hey, we made it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't know. That, that, that isn't that important. And there's a lot we don't know, but it's, but it's nice to realize we have the liberty to think a little bit about it because God entices us to do so. So we're going to hear a testimony, and I want to read this verse, and then we'll listen to it in just a, probably a minute. In verse 6 of chapter 4, it says, And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf or a, or a bull. The third living creature had a face like a man. 
And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So I want you to picture there are these four creatures around the throne. John sees them around the throne. I don't believe that they're on a leash. I believe they come and go. But John is brought into the picture at a time when he sees them around the throne. And when they worship, all the elders worship. So these, are, these, are, these beings never cease to be giving honor and reverence and, and using words to describe how worthy the Lord is. And then, and, and then when they're doing that, the elders can't help themselves but to worship too. Now we're not clear on who the elders are. I have a guess. And my guess is it's a representation of the priesthood of believers, both Old and New Testaments. Just my guess. And then, because David took the priest and broke them up into 24 groups, and they would minister one each week per year, and then there was four weeks a year where they would do, everybody was together doing stuff. And it's possible that the, the elders are made up of the priesthood of believers, those who said, I want to be an overcomer and entered into the development and the growth where they became what is the book, the seven letters says, these are the things, if you overcome, I will reward you with these things. Crowns, robes, things like that. And then these are the ones who position themselves. Other believers will get in. I believe that. And I'm, I, I believe that there, there's a difference between those who are faithful even to the point of martyrdom, as opposed to those who just get in. But getting in's a good thing. If you're not, if you're going, if you're going, if you're going to do the minimum, make sure it's you get in. But if you want to do more than that, the Lord has something for you. Okay, so that's the scene. Now I'll close in a little bit, but I want you to listen to this, and it's about 16 minutes. This testimony. Okay, it was done by Len Mink, who was a worship leader for a season of time for Kenneth Copeland Ministries when he would do his conventions. So Kenneth Copeland would rent, let's say, a big conference center, maybe like the Coliseum or something like that, and have what he's called believers meetings, and believers would, or vic, yeah, believe, voice of victory, believers meetings, anyway. <clears throat> I've been to one or two, so I, but anyway, and it was at, Len Mink was leading, and he had an experience, and this is what I want you to hear, okay? So are we good? Give it a shot. But I just wanted to say that. It's so powerful. So when we got to those words that said, Cherubim and Seraphim falling down before thee, I lifted my head and looked up to my left about 10 o'clock on the clock dial, up, up through the lighting grid, maybe 50, 75, 100 feet away from me. And I saw with my physical open eyes the most awesome, powerful, in a sense, terrifying, and I mean that in the godly good sense, most terrifying creature I have ever seen in my life. I don't mean like Hollywood. I, I mean... Whew, Forgive me, but words just don't describe it, but I will do my best in, in uh, painting you a picture of what this looked like. This creature was, I would say, 12 to 15 feet tall. It was hard to tell because of the distance, but it was enormous. It was massive. It was huge. It was like 
two and a half, three times the size of a normal six-foot human being. Uh, let me start at the top of this creature and describe to you what it looked like. I realize there may not be gender in the spirit realm, but let me just refer to this, this seraphim, uh, angelic-looking creature as he or him. The top of his head, there was hair looking, flowing, coming out of his head where a normal head of hair would be. But it wasn't hair. It was fire. And the only way I know how to describe it is that it was moving. This whole creature was moving, every part of it. Not moving around in the arena, but as you looked at it, every part of it was alive and moving. Its hair was flaming. It, it wasn't flame in the earthly sense where fire and combustion in the earthly sense burns up things with impurities in it and out of that comes colors like red and blue and orange and green and, and yellow and all those things. This was a fire, but it was a pure fire but it was burning, didn't make any noise, absolutely no noise, just burned. And it was flowing out like where hair should be, real thin, not spaghetti-like, but bigger than that. Uh, tongues of flames coming out, looked just like a big head of hair, but it was moving and burning. But it looked like liquid metal, like liquid platinum, but it was on fire. And it was moving rather rapidly. Uh, flowing, should I say. Okay, that's the first thing I noticed. Then as my eyes beheld the rest of it, I looked down and it looked like it had a headband on, a hairband around the top of the forehead. And when I looked closer, it wasn't uh, a headband. It looked like a headband with polka dots on it. What it was was a ring of eyes around the top of its head and they were smaller than the two eyes that were in the front of the face which I'll describe in a moment I don't know how many eyes were around the head of this thing the head was about the size of a bushel basket and uh, there must have been 15 or 20 of these eyes looking in all directions uh, even out from under the flaming uh, hair-like stuff on top, you could kind of trans—it was translucent. You could see this band of eyes wrapped all the way around the head of this creature, and they were looking in all directions, 360 degrees, all at the same time, seeing everything around this angel. The face of this creature was. The only way I can describe it, it looked like it was half human and half feline, like just a real, uh, a real chiseled, like an artist, uh, a sculptor would chisel a facial feature before he rounded off the corners, but the face had facets, like it was built out of rock. Uh, the eyes were were very deep and and they weren't proportionately large they weren't out of proportion but they were they were big they were they were dark in the fact that they were deep but they were filled with light so i don't know if that that sounds like a a paradox dark and light but they were just deep and and sensitive and and fiery and powerful and focused and concentrating. You could just tell this creature was concentrating with a concentration and a focus like I've never seen in any human anywhere. And uh, its its mouth was closed. It had a mouth. It was it was like I said, kind of a part lion and part human looking face. Now, it wasn't like uh, the TV thing, Beauty and the Beast, where that uh, Ron Perlman, the actor, had on that, you know, that lion-looking, 
face. It wasn't anything like that. It wasn't feline as such. It was just this awesome. I just don't know how to describe it. Forgive me. You just have to use your imagination best you can. It, it looked like a lion and a human combined. Uh, just, just, this thing was so powerful. I'll get into that in a minute. Its neck was uh, like a football player, weightlifter, wrestler type athletic. It didn't have any like tapering of the neck into the shoulders. Its neck came straight down from under its chin and hooked onto its shoulders, which seemed to be six feet wide. <laughs> It just so you could see the musculature defined the the facets like that were in his face, the chiseled facets came on down the neck, only uh, vertically chiseled uh, up and down, and then into its its shoulders. Uh, behind its shoulders were I will say wing like things. It, it was more like a force field than it was a wing uh, on each side. It came out from like the shoulder blade area and fanned out maybe 10 feet, 8 or 10 feet to each side. And it was like corrugated light. It was like wavy, like the northern lights, the aurora borealis, but without any color. Didn't have all those pretty colors that the, you know, the lights over the ice caps have. Uh, but it was wavy and folded like that. And it, w it just kind of went out to the side, real gauzy, and probably about 50% of the light level uh, of the rest of the creature. They were a little, a little dimmer, but there and moving, just, just moving, just, just an inch or two here and there, moving and, and tingling and undulating and pulsating with light. Uh, they didn't move up and down like wings or anything. It's, I, it, all I can say is, and I, this sounds weird, I guess, but it's, it's like a force field, just like some kind of force field behind this creature where these wing-like things were. That's all I know how to describe it. And it was wavy, wavy, uh, corrugated-looking uh, force field of light, gauzy, uh, translucent-looking, uh, shimmering. I'll keep throwing these adjectives and descriptives at you. Uh, let me move on down. This creature was not wearing clothes in the uh, earthly sense. It had what I would call folded light uh, hanging on it like a robe. You could see all the way through into other folds, like folds of light that were beneath other folds. They were a little dimmer because of the thickness. And it had like seven or eight different folds at one spot, and then it was just like one or two folds at another. And it did appear kind of like a hanging drape or robe. And it it kind of flowed with the anatomy, and yet it kind of hung straight too. I mean, you could tell there was an anatomy under there, but you couldn't really see it except for kind of the the movement and the contour of this robe of light. Uh, it moved. It it pulsated. Uh, it moved against itself like fabric would in a drape or a robe or some hanging something. The look on this thing's face, I just keep getting back to that, uh, was indescribable. It was the most, just in the face alone, had I never seen the rest of the anatomy, the face itself said everything. I'm telling you, this thing was so bright, it almost hurt my eyes. Uh, matter of fact, I had to have prayer for my eyes the next day because they were burning. My eyeballs literally were burning. Now, I don't know if it's because I looked up at the television lights and had a physical, just a very minor physical corneal uh, type of, of uh, irritation because of that, or if it was just the presence uh, being so strong. I don't know. I, it doesn't really matter. 
But uh, the face of this creature is so strong that it looked like he could have taken the world, the, earth, the whole earth in one hand and just pulverized it. That's the kind of strength I'm talking about. Uh, atomic bombs would look like pebbles next to the strength and the awesomeness of this creature. It had arms on it. I, I don't know how to describe them other than to tell you that it had arms that looked like the incredible hulk to the millionth power. These arms were huge, huge. You could see the definition like an artist would draw uh, musculature uh, around us, you know, the skeletal foundation. It, they were normal looking arms as far as anatomy were, was concerned, other than that they were just huge and muscular. Every part of them were just well defined, and I don't mean veins and things, but just muscle, like it was ridges and striations of light that looked like light muscles. <laughs> the only way I know how to describe it. The hands on this creature were probably twice the size proportionately of a normal human hand proportionate to the arms. They were twice the size. These hands were the most awe-inspiring things I have ever seen. They, they just... You could see, again, you could see the musculature in them and all of that, but the ability that you could see to do powerful things in these arms and in these hands, again, forgive me, but it just defies description. This is the kind of creature that literally could do anything. Uh, literally could move a whole planet with just the flick of a finger. That, that's the knowledge I had, the the knowing that I had about as far as the power of this this creature. Whew. Anyway, that's kind of the uh, the best I can do at describing what it looked like. Now, keep in mind, I looked at this thing for 15 or 20 minutes, and uh, it would look at me. It would turn its head slightly, maybe 15, 20 degrees, and just glance at me, very slow turn of the head, and more of a turn of the eyes, the two eyes that were in the front. The ones in the, around the top of its head never moved, but the ones in the front did, just ever so slightly move and look at me and make eye contact with me. And uh, that's when my flesh just about turned to spirit-filled jello, you know. And uh, then it would look back over the audience and kind of scan the audience real slow and methodically for about 15, 20 seconds. Then it would come back and just look at me for about 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And then it would turn back and look at the audience about the same amount of time, I guess. And then that happened about 15, 20 times. I didn't know exactly what to do. Uh, I know that I needed a guide for that moment. And I didn't feel in my spirit, even though I know Brother Copeland could, could come right up and discern that in his prophet's anointing and, and flow with that, I felt like Jesse Duplantis was supposed to come because he had been caught away to heaven for a five or six hour earth, earth hour period. And uh, I knew he was present, so I asked him to come up. He said when he approached where I was standing that he felt real strong heat waves, like from an atomic bomb, just intense, scorching heat waves, just one right after the other, hit him, almost knocked him down, he told me later. And I moved back and invited him, as best I could, to come and make sense out of this whole thing. And even though he didn't see this creature... He said, eventually, after kind of taking a reading on everything, he said to this 
this wonderful seraphim angelic creature move into this audience and do whatever you've come to do in the name of Jesus and let me just mention about that name before I tell you what the angel did at Jesse's uh, command I had the audience sing the first three words of Bill Gaither's tune Jesus 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 there's just something about that name and when we sang the name of Jesus when we spoke that name this angels wing things came around it it folded its hands and it bowed its head and at the mention of the name of Jesus that was probably one of the most impressive things another thing was when Jesse said move into the audience and do what you're supposed to do why you came this angel this angel kind of like in the cartoons that's the only way I know how to tell you kind of a exit stage left kind of thing this angel went a slight movement to the left and then went to the right real rapidly down over the audience and turned into a big flat uh, beam of light just a real razor thin intense beam of light and dispersed throughout the entire congregation of about I guess it was 10 or 12,000 people that night and uh, then I, I no longer saw the creature a bit more to this but um, just for sake of time what happened then is people started being healed as the angel made its rounds and people there was one usher saying he was walking and then all of a sudden he just fell on his face and began to worship and so a, a real strong worship presence came and it was testified to that everybody that went down went down face first nobody fell backwards everybody fell forward and just all over the auditorium as it went around now, um, this, in your notes, you'll find that in, even in Ezekiel chapter 1, there's a description very similar to this. And um, <clears throat> it was out of that passage that Amy McPherson, when she was speaking in Oakland, California in July 1922, was reading this passage uh, as, as was her style of ministry. She would just, she, she would preach... Um, 21 times a week and uh, so she didn't have time to put notes on the internet but she would open her Bible and the Lord would just lead her to her scripture and then she would begin to unpack it and the Lord would just move upon her he would give her an utterance over a scripture that could have been a spontaneous utterance and then when she was looking at this she ended up saying that she got the revelation of the four square gospel in that meeting and what she did is she saw the face of a man in, this, in Ezekiel, which is reflected in these seraphim beings that are often around the throne, that she saw a man of sorrows, so the, a savior. Then in the face of a lion, which Ezekiel talks about that we see also in this part of Revelation chapter 4, that one of the creatures had the face of a lion, she saw the baptizer with the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was the baptizer. Then the face of an ox typified the burden bearer so she, who took our infirmities, so that was Jesus the healer. And then the face of the eagle she saw reflected in the coming king who will come and sweep down and rescue the bridegroom. And so she ended up saying, why, that's the perfect gospel. It's the four square gospel. That's, that's where that four square came from. And the way she says it's a perfect gospel, a complete gospel for body, soul, spirit, and eternity. It is a gospel that faced squarely in every direction, a four-square gospel, in case you wondered where the name came from. It came from that actual meeting in that July of 1922. I'm going to wrap it up with these two things. One, this is, the, this is the revelation of Jesus who has been authorized to use these creatures that will work for him, and there's many more, 
many more, and the bride, the church, all, all of us, work in concert with him. He is rescuing the earth and bringing it into its creative design so that he, along with the church, and these, all this creation will offer the earth in perfection to the Father. And he, we see at the end of the Revelation, brings down the city, the new Jerusalem. The Lord comes and brings his presence, his throne on the planet. And then the, Lord, the Father will forever, and we too, use this place as ground zero for all of creation. We often think of um, Gnostics in the early time of the church would separate body and spirit. And they would say things like, uh, your spirit is what is really important. Your flesh is corruption. Uh, so your flesh is, God's going to burn your flesh and he's going to burn the earth, but he'll preserve your spirit. And so the Gnostics had this idea that what's important is your spirit. The earthly components are unimportant. Well, we kind of have a Gnostic view of things if we think that God treats the earth like that. Because, in fact, he is coming back to bring the earth into its fullness. He is not separating spirit from earth. He is bringing the two together where heaven and earth will come completely together and co-mingle to a point where the fullness of, in every aspect will be there. So it's kind of a Gnostic view for us to think we're going to go to heaven and live there forever. We're not. Heaven is a holding place until things get arranged in such a way that he can finish the master plan of, of redeeming the earth and all creation. So we have loved ones in heaven that are longing to be reclothed with an earthly clothing and come back and then set up the kingdom of God on this planet. I just want you to know that because oftentimes we have been conditioned to believe that getting to heaven is what it's all about. Getting to heaven is simply just a waiting room uh, to where God comes and recloses us, it, where mortality puts on immortality, and that we will be once again clothed. So, Grandma Dorothy, it's her birthday tomorrow, I think it is, and she passed away this. Within the, within the last year. She was 98. She would have been 99, I think, tomorrow. She is there in heaven now, young and vibrant and all that, waiting to be reclothed and come back with the saints with, and with the Lord to set up the planet. So I just want you to know that. Now, I want to close with this. We're going to sing, have the worship team come up. You can do that right now. We're going to sing the song that Len Mink was saying they were singing because it's just an old classic. It's holy, holy, holy. Lord, one of the old ones. I, there's a lot of songs with that name right now, but you'll recognize it. Um, <clears throat> I just want to give a couple more testimonies of what's going on. The reason it's so important, when we sing the name of Jesus, we should sing it. We have been privileged to declare that name, not only as a witness, but to the angelic host. We shouldn't just be passive when we sing. And, and I wish more songs, and I think we'll have more worship songs that will have the name of Jesus in it, the actual name, where we, we sing and use the name of Jesus. That's the, that's the songs that the angelic choir honor and want to be a part of. And can't you just picture this creature when the name of Jesus was being, that he took his wings and wrapped around in honor of Jesus. This creature, Jesus didn't come to save this creature, but he saw what a human man in his frailty, how he walked in perfect respect and harmony to the Father and literally redeemed humanity and all creation, that even creatures that didn't need to be saved are moved by this man-God that we call Jesus to where they recognize he is worthy to be worshipped. And we should adopt that fresh in our hearts and just know that name and he has given us permission to say that name whenever we want to. Right? The angels say, holy, holy, holy. And they respond when we say Jesus. We should say that name. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. 
It was a number of years ago, we had a Wisconsin camp meeting. We had a few of those, and we were in a room way over there, and I remember we were all worshiping, and I just had this vivid sense that there were angels, uh, like the four angels, stationed around the room. I don't know if you remember this, but... And I, I ended up getting on the platform, and I said, we need to engage with heaven now and worship. And we had pastors move around the perimeter, and we began to sing, and we were singing holy, 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 back and forth. It was this volley of holy, holy, holy. And my, I didn't see it with my natural eyes, but I couldn't not see it when I closed my eyes. was just these magnificent creatures just in honor of the Lord, participating with the saints as we would sing, holy is the name of Jesus. And these sentinels of sorts were just carrying God's glory and blessing the environment and participating with us. It was just this wonderful chorus of cooperation between heaven and earth. And I, and I know that there's other occasions I have more testimonies to share about that, but just for the sake of time, you get the picture. Don't underestimate. The Lord is saying to John, a door is open. Come and see it from my perspective. Not that you're, you're, you're struggling with this or they're telling you that or you're not feeling like you're getting breakthrough in this. He goes, don't live from that perspective. Live from this one. Rejoice over your predicament because the angels come and are stationed over that and there are ministers sent for you and for me to do the work of the kingdom. We, ha we, have, we have in partnership an amazing thing that we... We, we need to behold, behold, see it, see it. And I believe the time will come when many of us will literally see it often. Pretty cool stuff, huh? This is the letter of, it's not, well, is the Antichrist going to come out of, you know, Austria or something? I mean, you, it might be in there, but this is what the book is primarily about, at least first. And so let's do that, and then I'm just... What we're going to do is we're going to stand, we'll sing this song, just rejoice and, and be, be a blessing. Know that you're in the company of heavenly beings. And then we'll close and we'll make room for prayer if you want to come up and we'll do that, all right? Let's, let's stand. I think that's worthy to do that.